Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about the law of the gospel, which members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints covenanted to follow in the temple endowment ceremony. I've done previous videos on other covenants we make in the temple, and so if you haven't already, you'll want to check those out. Now, the law of the gospels are particularly enigmatic covenant because of the way we sometimes use the word gospel. Sometimes we use the word gospel as synonymous with the entire church and all of our beliefs, practices, theology, etc. And so it's a little bit odd that this massive gospel is also a subset of the temple endowment ceremony. However, in the context of the temple, I think there's a very specific definition of gospel that we're covenanting to adhere to. So in today's video, we're going to be going over that. What is the law of the gospel and why it's a necessary part of the plan of salvation? We're also going to be talking about additional ways that we can increase our holiness so that we can prepare ourselves to enter into the presence of the Lord, such as avoiding light mindedness and loud laughter. So let's get into it. In the endowment, members are invited to make sacred covenants to obey the law of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the higher law that he taught while he was on the earth. And that's coming straight from the general handbook of instruction. Jesus Christ defines his gospel in scripture many times, and every time he does, it includes the same things, faith, repentance, baptism, and the reception of the Holy Ghost. In other words, it's the first principles and ordinances of the gospel or the fourth article of faith. The Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants give us our clearest definitions. For example, in 3 Nephi, Jesus Christ clearly specifies... This is my gospel which I have given unto you, that I came into the world to do the will of my Father, that I might be lifted up upon the cross. Repent all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me and be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel. The Doctrine and Covenants likewise outlines the parameters of the gospel. Yea, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for remission of your sins, Yea, and be baptized even by water, and then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel. And remember that they shall have faith in me, or they can in no wise be saved. And again in DNC 39, it says, and this is my gospel, repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, even the comforter which showeth all things and teacheth the peaceable things of the kingdom. And there are many other scriptures that say this exact same thing. And if you're interested in finding out more about them, click the blog post in the description below. So the gospel, as Jesus Christ defines it, is faith, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. And this makes sense because the purpose of the temple endowment is to help us return to the presence of our heavenly parents. And the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are what help us to get there. We know that baptism is a requirement for salvation, but we also know that we can't be saved without faith in the grace of Jesus Christ, repentance, and the companionship of the Holy Ghost. So we've established that the law of the gospel are those first principles and ordinances of the gospel, faith, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. But again, it may seem odd that we covenant in the endowment to obey those things, faith, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost, when in order to even be endowed in the first place, you need to have already done those things. You cannot receive your endowment in the temple unless you've already been baptized, and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So perhaps in the endowment we covenant to live these first principles and ordinances of the gospel because we should consider them not as one-time events, but as a continual process of improvement. After all, we renew our baptismal covenants each week when we partake of the sacrament. Each week we recommit to those first principles and ordinances of the gospel. Faith, baptism, repentance, and the Holy Ghost are continuing principles. We need to consistently nurture faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and we need to continually repent. And as we do those two things, we are repeatedly washing our garments in the blood of the Lamb. The ritual act of baptism is a one-time event, but it's a symbol of our commitment to always be cleansing ourselves of unrighteousness through the grace of the atonement of Jesus Christ. And this repeated process is what qualifies us for the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. We are given the gift of the Holy Ghost at baptism, but it is up to us to continually receive it. The law of the gospel is also different from the covenants we make at baptism because of the level of commitment. Valiant K. Jones has said, we might question why the law of the gospel would be included as one of the temple covenants since it is a covenant that all members who go to the temple have already entered into when they are baptized. I believe that the answer lies in the level at which we are expected to live the law of the gospel. When we commit to keep this law at the time we are baptized, we are just starting out on the gospel path and we have a lot to learn. But when we commit to keep the law of the gospel as part of our temple covenants, we are committing to live it in a higher, holier way, including the principles taught by Jesus Christ in his sermon at the temple and his sermon on the mount. The law of the gospel overlaps with and builds upon the previous two temple covenants, which we've covered in other videos. 
Alma the Elder taught that baptism is a witness before him that ye have entered into a covenant with him, that ye will serve him and keep his commandments, that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you. In other words, as we sacrifice and obey God's commandments, which we covenant to do in the temple, we're better qualified to live the principles of faith, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. All the temple covenants build upon each other, overlap with each other, iterate upon each other to help us progressively refine our characters and souls to enter the presence of God. In addition to recommitting to live those first principles and ordinances of the gospel, the scriptures and the temple identify additional ways that we can elevate our holiness to enter into the presence of God. The Doctrine and Covenant states that your incomings may be in the name of the Lord, that your outgoings may be in the name of the Lord, that all your salutations may be in the name of the Lord with uplifted hands unto the Most High. Therefore, cease from all your light speeches, from all laughter, from all your lustful desires, and from all your pride and light-mindedness, and from all your wicked doings. So this scripture identifies light-mindedness, laughter, lustful desires, pride, and wickedness as ways that can distract from our holiness. It also admonishes to reverence the name of the Lord. So let's go over some of these as they relate to our temple covenants. One way we can become holier is by avoiding light-mindedness. Now, I should be clear that I'm not referring to lightheartedness or cheerfulness or happiness, rather that we should avoid making light of sacred things. The Encyclopedia of Mormonism says, Modern scripture deals with light-mindedness as trivializing the sacred or making light of sacred things. Latter-day Saints were admonished early in the history of the church to trifle not with sacred things. At its worst, light-mindedness may become ridicule and then sacrilege and blasphemy, a deliberate irreverence for the things of God. We're also warned against the loud laughter, and this is another confusing one because laughter in itself is a good and a beautiful thing. I mean, just think of all the times general authorities crack jokes in general conference. As I surveyed laughter in the scriptures, it's clear that the Lord doesn't condemn all forms of good humor and laughter. Rather, he's talking about specific kinds of laughter. The scriptures often admonish against laughing to scorn, and this means to mock, ridicule, or to hold in derision. And it's also related to light-mindedness, as in laughing at sacred things. DNC 59 states, Verily, this is fasting and prayer, or in other words, rejoicing and prayer. And inasmuch as ye do these things with thanksgiving, with cheerful hearts and countenances, not with much laughter, for this is a sin, but with a glad heart and a cheerful countenance. When we brazenly laugh at or mock God's most sacred, precious things, we disrespect God and break that first commandment to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength. It should also cause us to pause about how we're treating our fellow man or how we're following that second great commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself. We should never mock, deride, or ridicule anyone. Evil speaking of the Lord's anointed is another vice that the scriptures warn against. It's pretty straightforward, but also has multiple layers of application. First, the scriptures are clear that speaking evil about anyone is bad. The Psalms are full of warnings about speaking evil and having a sharp tongue. Psalm 34 says, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Speak peace and pursue it. But to get a little more specific, the temple warns against speaking evil against the Lord's anointed. When you make sacred covenants in the temple, take a look around the endowment room at the people around you. Who in that room has been anointed? Everyone. Perhaps the warning on speaking evil can apply to everyone in the covenant community. Everyone who's been washed, anointed, and endowed with holy priesthood power has been anointed for holy purposes unto the Lord and deserves honor and respect. And that also includes you. Evil speaking of yourself is a form of evil speaking of the Lord's anointed priests and priestesses. The scriptures talk about another category of evil speaking, and that's against the Lord's anointed leaders. This can apply to ancient prophets or kings and also can apply to modern church leaders today. As part of becoming a covenant community, we agree to support and sustain the Lord's appointed leaders, even when their teachings do not always align with society's values. Psalm 105 says, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Acts 23 similarly teaches, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now, I don't think this means there's no room to work through times when you're struggling with decisions or teachings from church leaders. The church values feedback and counsels as a form of decision making. However, we should never mock, deride, ridicule, or be hostile to the Lord's appointed leaders. Sustaining and supporting our leaders contributes to the unity and harmony of the covenant community, but it also shows honor and respect to God. I think this most importantly applies to the Lord's anointed prophet and apostles, but it can also apply in varying degrees to other general officers and our local church leaders. Another unholy practice is taking the name of God in vain. This is one of the oldest commandments, and it's one of the ten that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. 
Exodus states, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The Doctrine and Covenants and other scriptures likewise warn against taking the Lord's name in vain. Behold, I am Alpha and Omega, even Jesus Christ. Wherefore, let all men beware how they take my name in their lips. For behold, verily I say that there be many who are under this condemnation who use the name of the Lord and use it in vain, having not authority. Taking the Lord's name in vain can take a variety of forms. It could be using his name as an expletive or as a replacement for a swear word. I mean, that's certainly disrespectful. It could be committing evil in God's name or pretending to serve God, but really failing to do so. In certain periods of ancient Judaism, it may even have been considered blasphemous to even speak the name of God without proper authority. Avoiding light-mindedness, loud laughter, evil speaking, and taking the name of God in vain all help us to show Jesus Christ that we are serious in becoming holy like he is. No unclean thing can enter the presence of God and the temple endowment is trying to help us do that, to enter the presence of God. Through these practices of holiness, we are trying to wash our garments in the blood of the lamb. We are striving to be clean of the blood and sins of this generation by relying on the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. So to summarize, the law of the gospel consists of the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. First, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, repentance. Third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And fourth, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, the fourth article of faith. By covenanting to continually live these principles throughout our lives, we are securing ourselves on the covenant path. We additionally promise to make ourselves more holy by abstaining from certain practices such as light-mindedness, loud laughter, evil speaking, and taking the name of God in vain. By abstaining from these, we honor that first great commandment to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength. We honor the name of God and his appointed leaders. We also honor the second great commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself. We promise to abstain from mocking, ridiculing, or demeaning others. We strive to treat each individual, especially in God's covenant community, as precious children of an almighty God. As we strive to do our best to be holy, to have faith, repent, be baptized, and have the companionship of the Holy Ghost, we can ultimately enter the presence of God.